When asked about the history of mathematics, some names probably come to mind. Probably Pythagoras, maybe Euclid, Archimedes, maybe Newton and Leibniz, the inventors of calculus, maybe, if you're particularly well-versed, Euler and Gauss. However, mathematics is a worldwide phenomenon, and throughout all human history, humans have discovered that mathematics is very helpful and answers a lot of questions, from just being able to count the things around you, all the way up to complex functions and equations that explain the world and the phenomena that we see around us. So mathematics has a long and rich history that coexists with humans, and a lot of the players in mathematics are not well known. And this is the problem that Kate Kitagawa and Timothy Revel attempt to rectify in their book, The Secret Lives of Numbers a hidden history of math's unsung trailblazers. So I love reading about math, and this is a book that I saw on my library's new shelf. I decided to take it out and give it a read. I listened to this via audiobook with using the physical book to look at the illustrations because there are illustrations in this, and I felt like this was a fantastic book. So I wanna talk about some of the parts that I enjoyed and a brief outline so you know what you're getting into if you choose to read The Secret Lives of Numbers, as well as share some of the most interesting anecdotes that I found in this book so you can determine if this book is right for you to read. And as always, if you've read this book, please let me know in the comment section down below the parts you liked, the parts you didn't like, and your thoughts on this book. I love to hear people's thoughts and opinions on the books that I have also read. So please share in the comment section down below. I love to receive it. So as the subtitle implies, The Secret Life of Numbers is about math's unsung heroes. So as mentioned, mathematics has been used in every civilization throughout the world. Many, many people groups, almost all people groups have developed at least counting, but many, many people throughout history have discovered that this math thing is quite good at describing the world around us. It's very useful in terms of economic activity, and there's a real a real usefulness to developing some level of mathematics to help your society survive, thrive grow bigger. And a lot of the people who we associate with mathematics, the heavyweights, the people who we think of when we think of math, Pythagoras, Newton, are not the only people who contributed to mathematics, which is not in any way to diminish their accomplishments or what they've contributed. But there's a lot of people who have touched on a lot of interesting concepts throughout the world. And this book is just an attempt to bring to light maybe some more interesting people or people names that you don't normally hear about. I do have some minor complaints, but I'm gonna save the minor complaints about this book to the end of this video, because I think this is a fantastic and really good introduction if your history of mathematics is quite sparse, or you know some big players and names, but you haven't heard a lot about maybe some of the more, I don't wanna say minor players, but players that are not normally mentioned. So this is a fantastic starting point. However, if you do have history in mathematics, you will probably hear some names that you are also familiar with in the review of this book. So this book is roughly chronological and maybe what we think of as the history of mathematics. It starts in ancient times and we spend a lot of time in ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, ancient China, and ancient Americas. So I know all these time frames don't exactly overlap, but there is some good amount of time spent in the ancient world. And a lot of ancient mathematics was by nature very application focused. So it wasn't as much theoretical, although theoretical and thought experiments did exist. There was a lot of emphasis on building timekeeping and being able to see what's going on in the heavens. That is of utmost importance to a lot of these areas. And so being able to predict what's going to happen, being able to solve things like uh, geometry problems to divide up a field are very, very important in the ancient world. This is the section that I found very interesting because it includes many things that many of us take for granted today, like using base 60 and things like our hours, minutes, or division of a circle, which if you're not familiar with comes from the Babylonians. So this is an ancient concept that has come to us to today. But the author also dives into some things that I was not familiar with, which is really refreshing as someone who reads a lot of math books, such as the mathematician Kidin or Kidinu, who was a ancient uh, Mesopotamian mathematician whose name I had not come across before, as well as spending a lot of time in ancient China, which ancient Chinese mathematics is something that I really haven't done a lot of reading on, but I would love to. She, um, she being the author, although there's also Timothy Revel on the author, I 
yeah, Kate Kitagawa and Timothy Rebel, but the both of them spend some time focusing on a woman named Ben Zhao, who was a Chinese mathematician and a woman, which is a little different from what we see in a lot of human history, or a lot of the history of mathematics tends to be very male dominated. Some of that intentional, maybe some of that not intentional. But Ben Zhao was a name that I had never come across before, and her story is sort of told in the ancient China section. We also, at the beginning of this section or the beginning of this book, cover names like Hypatia, which you may be familiar with. She was in Alexandria and she was killed by a Christian mob who was upset at various things. There was some internal power struggles, but she was um, a noted or named female scholar. So she gets some time in the sun. And so at that point, we've kind of covered, the, there's other bits mentioned, but that's the ancient world. So the ancient world is sort of discussed. There's also some forays into the ancient Greeks and the great accomplishments that they made. However, this is a book that tries to focus on maybe the unsung heroes or the people we don't hear about as often. So maybe the Greeks don't get as much screen time as you would like, but that is due to the, the nature and the focus of this book. Then there is some time spent in the uh, Indian world, in the Indian subcontinent, and in the Islamic world. These are sections that I would think would be quite self-evident to people, but again, I think I have a very biased view of mathematics because I've studied mathematics, my bachelor's degree is in math, and I've read a lot of books on math. So what I think is normal or common knowledge might not actually be. But uh, India, the Indian subcontinent and the Islamic world um, have contributed greatly to the world of mathematics. We use Hindu Arabic numerals and that comes uh, through the Arabic world by way, or comes from India by way of the uh, Arabic world. We discuss in this book things like the House of Wisdom, which was, uh, I believe, located in Baghdad, but was a very, uh, a hotbed of learning in, uh, I feel like hotbed implies violence, a, a center of learning in the Islamic world for Islamic thought that unfortunately came to a uh, very violent end. Um, I wasn't aware of how the, um, what the downfall, I guess, of the House of Wisdom, but that is sort of covered. But that Arabic world, the Islamic world, really preserved a lot of knowledge, and that's knowledge and also new inventions that came through the Arab world from India made its way to the West, which revolutionized learning. So this is covered in a book that I also reviewed on this channel about Fibonacci, which I can link. And there was a lot of knowledge preserved and we have names like Al-Kindi and Al-Khwarizmi where we get names like um, algebra and algorithm. And those things have greatly contributed to the mathematic world today. So I'm glad to see that we covered that. There was also some discussion in this section of concepts that, again, I would hope would be familiar to people but might not be, such as the concept of zero and the place value system. So zero is not an intuitive concept and neither is like this place value system. So if you see the number 1, 10, and 100, the, the difference in size, like if you have $1, $10, and $100, those are very different sizes, but we write them using this these zeros and ones but they mean different things because of the, the placement. And that is not something that just intuitively developed. This was something that was, uh, that had to be kind of, I don't know, discovered. That's a whole, the idea of mathematics is, mathematics is innate or discovered is like a whole debate, I know. But that was something that had to come to the world and people had to think about this. Same with the idea of zero being nothing. And a very interesting experiment that I had never heard about before was mentioned in this book. And they took children age four and put them in front of a computer screen. I believe the age four was picked, if I had to guess, because at that point, children haven't really entered formal education. And they were asked to select a box from the screen that had the fewest number of dots in it. So there was boxes with dots and the, the numbers of dots in the boxes would be like eight, four, three, one. And then one of the boxes would be blank, representing zero. And a not insignificant portion I think they said 40% of the children or 40 to 50% of the children could get it correct, that zero was the least amount of dots. But the idea that zero was less than one or the concept of zero did not appear to be innate in these children. And that's something that has made a massive impact. The idea of zero has really made a massive impact on mathematics and mathematical history. And so the idea of zero is a very fundamental starting point in history that many of us take for granted. Like once zero and the place value system and Hindu Arabic numerals come into play, the mathematics world just opens up in, in a fantastic way. So something we have the uh, Indian subcontinent and the Arabic world to thank. 
Now, this section also included a brief journey into Jainism, which is a world religion. And this was something I had never heard of before, but in their philosophy, they had this idea that some, infin some infinities could be bigger than other infinities. And this is something that was discovered or also written about by um, Cantor later, I think in the 1800s. So the, the, the philosophy in Jainism had already explored this idea that some infinities could be greater than others before Cantor did, but Cantor of course wrote quite a bit more extensively on it and he's usually assigned to this, but there's this idea that other places in the world have also independently come to different conclusions that were found later in history or at other times in history. Now, the probably the biggest example of things being discovered at the same time is the example of calculus being discovered independently and around the same time by both Newton and Leibniz. I believe the timeline is Newton discovers it first but is unable to publish it. Leibniz independently discovers the same thing and publishes it, but then Newton publishes it. Newton is able to use some positions of power to try to push Leibniz down, but essentially Newton and Leibniz discover calculus. And this is to the bane of many, many high school students throughout the world, even though I actually found calculus to be quite fun. Calculus is where I started to like mathematics. I will just say that. Doesn't mean it was always easy, but calculus is where, for me, math started to get a little bit of fun. A little bit fun. But Newton and Leibniz were not the only people who had reached they were the breakthrough. They were the people who really pushed this into the forth forefront of human history, mathematical history. But this wasn't an idea that was totally out of out of reach for every other person before. And the author talks about other groups, particularly a school in India, that was kind of touching at that idea many, many years before. They didn't formally develop it in the same way that Newton and Leibniz did, nor would I say it had the same impact just because that the discovery by Newton and Leibniz really pushed forward that field. But other people have reached and touched this idea of calculus before Newton and Leibniz. So this isn't something that no one else in the world could discover, um, which is not to downplay, again, the accomplishments of those two individuals. The thing that was really interesting here was I was getting intrigued. So I went to the calculus Wikipedia page and there's a whole section of all the various people in the world, different groups in the world, different texts or yeah, schools that have touched this idea and kind of the idea that people were were reaching at it it was very interesting, and if you want to go on a little Wikipedia detour, that section is very, very interesting. So I really liked that section that was on the ancient precursors of calculus because that was really, really interesting to me. And a lot of that stuff I wasn't familiar with. I'm, of course, familiar with Newton and Leibniz, but everything that came before is, uh, or the other groups, other areas in the world that kind of touched on these ideas before was completely new to me. I think it was, was it Newton who said, if I see further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, Newton, of course, built on people he had access to and texts he had access to, which may not have included or did not include like the Indian school that was kind of working with those ideas previously. It is true that math kind of builds. And so people are necessarily working on work that has been done in previous generations. The book then concludes with some of the people who really fought against discrimination in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries. There was some interesting points. One, just a curiosity I wanted to mention, where in Parisian salons, it was very fashionable for upper class ladies to have a natural history closet where they could show off these natural history items they had collected. And I think we should bring that back. I don't have a natural history closet, but I would love if one day when I have a house, I invite guests over and they can look at my natural history closet. I think it's fun. I think we should bring it back. Just the idea of the salon too, where like you come over and talk academic things. It was a way for women to engage in the world in a world where they were not allowed to do things like hold professorship or complete a PhD. So there's a whole raft of characters mentioned in this section who were barred from entering colleges or obtaining degrees, but were able to contribute positively to the world of mathematics, people who were excluded due to their race or due to their gender. So that section includes a number of people, but is a time frame that's closer to our time frame, so maybe feels a little bit more relevant. Overall, I really did enjoy this book. As I probably alluded to, there were times where I felt like the author, at least to me, maybe sounded a little condescending. Like at the beginning, I just felt like the tone was, you probably think that the only people who did math were the Europeans. No, I don't think that at all. I, I feel like that's not an and that's not uncommon knowledge. I really hope that's not uncommon knowledge. So I just felt like the tone was, you're not very bright and you probably don't know that people beyond the Europeans did mathematics. 
I felt like that tone was a little bit condescending. I really, I was like, ooh, is this going to be a bad book? But then the book was so, so good. And I really think that maybe the author wasn't intending to be condescending, but was maybe trying to challenge beliefs or people who have no familiarity with mathematics. Maybe you did not think about math since you passed algebra in high school by the skin of your teeth and you decided you are never going to look at math again. And the only names you know are Pythagoras and... I don't know, Albert Einstein, and you think maybe you have no clue who else in the world has been doing and developing mathematics. So I think the author was really just trying to start a conversation or uh, put lace thoughts in your head. But for me, and this might be due to maybe my more extensive reading on the subject. Extensive is kind of a weird word to use, but I've read a number of like popular mathematics books. And of course, I have the background, the degree in math. I felt like I wasn't unaware of non-European achievements in mathematics and many of these people who the author at least at the very beginning would imply I would have never heard of had been covered extensively in the math courses I took in college so like Sophie Kovaleski was an example who was brought up in um, multiple of my classes uh, so I felt like that tone throughout the book like you probably think it's all Europeans was a bit like no I would like to th hope and think that most people or a good portion of people know that there were mathematic achievements throughout human history, throughout history, throughout time among many different people. And so that annoyed me a little bit. But overall, I still gave this book like a four, four and a half rating because it was so, so good. It was very engaging, very entertaining, and I think it would be entertaining even for people without a strong interest in math. So I really, really recommend if you enjoy math history or if anything in this book review sounds interesting, Check out The Secret Lives of Numbers by Kate Kitagawa and Timothy Revel. I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend it. I have a few nitpicks with it, but overall, I really, really enjoyed this book, and I hope you do as well if you choose to pick it up. Please let me know what you thought of this book in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great rest.